Can I start? Okay. Hello everyone, this is Im Sui from Seoul National University and I'm a PhD student of Seoul National University Toy Tank Laboratory. And I am a presenter of a pressure-based compressible flow solver for capitalization erosion assessment. And these are my contents. Uh, firstly, I will introduce my research and secondly, I will explain my numerical method and then test models. And I will talk about research and discussions and conclusions. First, introduction. Cavitation and erosion can cause harmful effects such as performance degradation and structural damages. Due to harmful effects, the prediction and prevention methods for cavitation and erosion have been an important research topic in many decades. Uh, you can see eroded surface of marine propeller in here and dam slip, uh, slip way of dam. Uh, a prediction method for cavitation erosion based on physical condition is required. So to apply uh, the prediction method for cavitation erosion assessment to hydrodynamic machinery, validation for the prediction method is required. Okay. And the cavitation is mostly composed of vapor or gas. So to simulate cavitating flows precisely, it is need to use a compressible flow solver. Uh, this is my objective. The assessment of cavitation erosion in an axisymmetric nozzle using a pressure-based fully compressible cavitating flow solver. You can see the cavitation erosion test for uh, the, the axisymmetric nozzle and eroded target plate of Frank 2009. Uh, this is, these are our lines. <coughs> the pressure-based fully compressible cavitating flow solver and a prediction method for cavitation erosion assessment are introduced. And cavitating flows around the simple geometry are, to, uh, are simulated to validate the, the numerical method. Uh, in this study, a hemispherical head form cylindrical body is used for the simple geometry. The cavitating flows are in nozzle are simulated and cavitation erosion will be predicted. And I will explain my numerical methods. For the governing equations, the nozzle average continuity and momentum equations are used. Um, for the energy equation, the temperature equation for multi-phase flow is used. You can see the details in here. Lambda effective means effective heat transport coefficient and K means kinetic energy of fluid and alpha means volume fraction. And CV means specific heat capacity of each phase. Uh, to simulate multi-phase flow, I use the transport equation of volume fraction mixture. S alpha compressible and S alpha cavitation in the right hand side means source term due to compressibility and source term due to phase changes. Uh, source term due to compressibility in this study uh, it can be written as follow. You can, or you can see the details and derivation of these terms in Miller et al. 2013. And this high means compressibility of each phase. Uh, this is cavitation model in this study. In this study, the cavitation model by Schinner-Sauer is used. If you use Schnosauer model, you can write the SF cavitation like this. And CC and CB is also mentioned by him. Uh, it's model constant. For the model constant in this study, CC and CV equals equal one is used. And then, uh, for the equation of state for vapor, I use the ideal gas EOS. You can see the equation. And IV means gas constant for vapor or steam. And for the equation of state for liquid, I use the perfect fluid EOS. You can see the details in here. Uh, 
In this study, the pressure-based fully compressible cavitating flow solver is used. So the pressure equation derived from discretized momentum equation can be written as follows. You can see the rho h by a in this side and Laplacian of p and divergence of up in here, okay? For compressible multi-phase flow, divergence of velocity of cell center can be written as follow. Um, you can also find the details and derivation in Miller et al. 2013. And S-alpha means, S-alpha in right-hand side means sum of source terms or volume fraction transport equation. Uh, these are assessment methods in previous studies for cavitation erosion. Lee et al. argued that the potential power of macro cavity that forms the basis of cavitation aggressiveness. They, uh, they propose P potential power as function of volume of vapor and pressure and derivatives of those terms. But they use only DPDT to assess cavitation erosion. So, and Nomi et al. proposed that the candidate formula of numerical cavitation aggressiveness, you can see the details. And they argued that cavitation erosion can uh, can be can be uh, can occur in following hazardous conditions. These conditions. Uh, this is prediction method for cavitation erosion assessment in this study. Uh, in this study, the intensity of erosion for assessment in, is defined as follow. Uh, Firstly, I introduce a variable PI that could sufficiently, uh, sufficiently reflect the potential power of Lee et al. and satisfy hazardous conditions of Nomi et al. You can see the highlighted, highlighted terms of Lee at this study matches each other. Okay. Uh, the intensity of erosion is defined as the time integration of PI. So we assume that, assess that the area with the high value of the intensity of erosion is the area of high probability of cavitation erosion. So, uh, this is our test model. Uh, to validate the pressure-based fully compressible cavitating flow solver, the cavitation flows around the hemispherical head-formed cylindrical body are simulated. So, I used the hemispherical head form cylindrical body of Rosen McNaught and I simulated the cavitating flows for one Lehner's condition and two cavitating number condition. Uh, and I assume that this problem is 2D axis symmetry problem and you can see the computational domain and boundary conditions for the cylindrical body. Cavitating flows in the axisymmetry node are simulated with the validated solver and cavitation erosion is predicted. Uh, I used the axisymmetry node geometry of Frank 2009 and, and I simulate cavitating flows for one cavitation number condition and one Reynolds number condition. And I also assume that this problem is to the axisymmetric problem. And you can see the computational domains and bound, boundary conditions at, for the axisymmetric nodule. Uh, this bottom boundary is a target plate to be eroded. Uh, these are computational meshes. The structural meshes are used for the cylindrical body and the nozzle. And 11,000, I used 11,900 cells for hemispherical head form cylindrical body. I, this area is zoomed in this. Uh, and I used 10,525 cells for axisymmetry node. Okay. And this is result and discussions. Uh, this figure shows that 
the cavities and non-dimensional light velocity around the cylindrical body when the strongest reentrance occurs. You can see the reentrance jet in right figures. Uh, alpha is less than 0 0.5 in the gray colored area. And the compressible solver predicts a more powerful reentrance jet the, uh, then the incompressible flow solver, you can see in uh, red arrow. This is the, uh, this figure shows the pressure distribution on the cylindrical body. Um, this, okay. Black, dot, black dots uh, stand for Rosen, experimental results of Rose and Magnum and Orange line stands for result of incompressible flow solver, and blue lines means the result of present study. Okay, and you can see the present results show good agreement with the experimental results of Rose and Magnum. So the solver and numerical method present reliable result. But uh, at non cavitating condition, the result of incompressible and compressible flow solver show good agreement. But at cavitating condition, the compressible flow solver predicts reentrance more precisely than incompressible flow solver. And the stagnation pressure after cavitation closure of the compressible flow solver is higher than the incompressible so flow solver. Uh, this figure shows volume fraction in the axisymmetric module. Uh, at t equals t zero, there is no cavities in the nozzle, and thereafter cavities that occur near throat of nozzle becomes large. Okay. And this figures also show the volume fraction in axisymmetric nozzle. And then cavity detaches from the throat of nozzle. After detachment, the big cavities are divided into small cavities. And thereafter, the total volume cavity decreases, and all cavities is in the nozzle vanish. And this cycle is repeated for solution time. Okay. This figure shows the maximum pressure in the nozzle and the maximum pressure is investigated during solution time. And the intensity of erosion in this study is the function of pressure. So I investigate maximum pressure. Uh, at the target plate bottom, a region near R equals 23 millimeters shows high maximum pressure. Okay. And this figure shows the maximum dipidity in the nozzle. Maximum dipidity is also investigated during solution time. Uh, at the target plate bottom, the region of R equals 19 to 21 millimeters, and near R equals 23 millimeters shows high maximum value of dipidity. Uh, this figure shows the result of assessment of cavitation erosion. Um, Blue line present the numerical prediction of this study, and black line means the depth of penetration of experimental lizard, Frank, at Frank 2009. Um, uh, I think the numerical prediction shows good agreement of the area with a high probability of cavitation erosion with the experiment. And you can see the local maxima of present results occurs in re region near R equals 20 millimeters and 23 millimeters, where the local maxima of pressure and DPDT occur in occur. Okay. Uh, this is some discussions. Uh, location where the maximum intensity uh, maximum intensity appears is in this in the present research is different from the location where the maximum depth appears in experiments. Okay. 
I think the roughness of surface of nodule will change due to penetration in experiment, but the changes roughness is not implemented in this numerical method. Uh, the changes of roughness might lead to changes of cavitating flows in the, no the nodule, and the cavitating flow in the nodule are simulated as 2D asymmetry problem in this study, but however, the cavity might have effect by 3D flow. So the different cavity shape would cause different cavitation erosion, I think. Okay, this is conclusions. The pressure-based fully compressible cavitating flow server and the prediction method for cavitation erosion assessment are introduced. And the cavitating flows around the hemispherical head form cylindrical body are simulated using compressible flow solver. And the present results show good agreement with the experimental research and the numerical method present reliable research. Uh, the cavitating flow in the nozzle are simulated using the compressible flow solver and cavitation erosion assessed with the proposed prediction method. And the numerical method show good agreement with of, uh, of the, the area with a high probability of cavitation erosion with the, exper the experiment. Uh, for the future work, uh, I'm, constant, I'm focused on uh, future further development for a cavitating flow solver and a prediction method for erosion assessment with the change of roughness due to cavitation erosion. Okay. Thank you. So uh, the floor is open for some audience questions, if there are any. Okay, I'll just get the mic to you. Thank you for your talk. I remember you presented that this work was done in the context of Reynolds average Nyquist Stokes equations. Is that correct? Uh, uh, okay. You use RANS? Yes. I don't remember how you described the turbulence closure. How did you deal with that? I use K omega SST turbulence model. So I think, yeah. In the future work, will you consider s uh, steady, sol uh, steady solutions or will you st consider uh, any resolved s simulation approaches? Uh, can you say this again? Sure. So in this simulation, it was unsteady. Yes. And you're using a RANS model. Yeah. Will you, in the future, try to do a steady simulation and see if you're uh, still able to capture cavitation? That's the first question. And the second question, will you consider moving to, because you mentioned 3D, will you consider moving to something like a large eddy simulation where you can capture the, the turbulence more? Uh, for the first question, uh, it, is, uh, it might be hard to simulate unsteady flows, uh, unsteady, unsteady flows over, so because, because of the unsteadiness of cavitation, so I think it might be impossible. And for the second question, yes, I want to test in, in I, I want to simulate using areas or DNS model, but this, but they are so expensive, so it's hard to say yes, but I want to. Hi, it's a great presentation. Uh, if you could, just you could stay here actually. Uh, when you presented the results from Frank, do you remember what was your simulation time? So how many sheddings did you do for the erosion uh, data? Ah, okay. Just uh, uh, because I did some simulations and I noticed my results would get uh, obviously better the more I increased my sampling time. So I saw that you have some uh, scattering in your erosion results, so I was wondering if they, um, that might be the cause. Actually, the simulation was done in one second for solution time, mm -hmm. and it might be a uh, 400 cycles for
for cavitation erosion, uh, cavitation growth and collapse. Okay, okay, okay. That's in Simon. Uh, I did some simulations on the same same axisymmetric geometry. It was for I think half a second, uh, but. Uh, I did 2D simulations and I had scattering of results similar to yours, but when I uh, did a three-dimensional uh, simulation with, uh, I believe it was 20 degrees, and then I radially averaged my results, the results were much better and closer to, to experimental results. So that might be the cause, but just for to say it. So if you do a three-dimensional simulation, you mm -hmm. just might get better results because you have more sampling uh, points. Okay. That's Thank you for your comment. Any other audience questions? Okay, I have one question. Yes. Um, actually, it's quite relevant to this plot itself. Uh, the incipience of the start of cavitation typically is highly dependent on the inlet curvature, like the sharper curvature that you have, the, sh the inlet corner uh, yes. where in cavitation is starting. That radius plays a big role in the start of cavitation. Uh, did you? Uh, I mean, how did you arrive at that curvature? Is it something from the design that you validated with experiments, or is it something that you picked? And did you test for some sensitivity to that, that sharpness of that corner? Sharpness that is, of the corner. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I feel that the nozzle throat. Okay. Uh, I fill it the uh, sharp corner by R equal, uh, R equals one millimeters, millimeter. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, Frank's, uh, Frank 2009, uh, Frank says the fillet, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, this is based on previous studies. Oh, it's uh, based okay. on previous studies, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. okay. So Forgive my poor English. Uh, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, are there any further questions at this point? If not, let's thank the speaker. Okay, I think I can get started uh, with introducing the next speaker. It's uh, Joshua Brinkerhoff from the University of British Columbia at Okanagan. And he's gonna talk to us today about direct numerical simulation of a translational cryogenic cavitating mixing layer of liquefied natural gas behind a flat splitter plate. Wow, that's a long title. <laughs> Joshua, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. I will be presenting this work on behalf of my postdoc fellow and former PhD student, Dr. Saeed Robert Manish, who did the work. And uh, I'm happy that this conference is going well. It's not like the Entropy Conference, which always seems to get more disordered every year. With that little physics joke, I'll uh, give a brief introduction to my work. So cavitation, as our previous two talks talked about, is the formation of vapor bubbles in a flowing liquid in a region where the local pressure of the liquid falls below the vapor pressure and oftentimes is considered to occur under isothermal conditions. However, in cryogens, which are ultra-cold liquids, where they would be in a gas at room temperature but are kept at very cold temperatures to increase their energy density and volume, like liquid natural gas or liquid hydrogen or also liquid, uh, liquid nitrogen, cavitation can occur and undergo or is particularly sensitive to thermal effects. And so thermal fluctuations are important and energy modeling as the previous talk described is important. Moreover, in cryogens, because the gas is so cold, it's quite dense and so the liquid to vapor density ratio is small, which is often not the case under isothermal cavitation conditions. Moreover, the saturation conditions, the saturation properties of the material are sensitive to temperature, and so there's a quite significant temperature variation in the saturation, saturation conditions, and thereby large slopes in the pressure temperature saturation curve. And this results in additional vorticity production mechanisms that can couple with vapor production and make the cavitation more complicated. Obviously, in term machinery, cavitation is important to understand in order to understand 
the interactions with erosion and other, con uh, other uh, deleterious factors that we don't want to occur. Um, the features that we're, we're in, in, in interested in oftentimes relate to small incipient cavities that are present with a short residence time, although there may also be attached sheet cavitation, such as partial or super cavity cavitation, where the attached sheets uh, are, remain attached to the wall and, and either in a steady or an unsteady sense. And then there's a shear cavitation where we want to understand the interaction of the phase change process with shear instabilities or the creation of uh, vortical structures in the flow. And that's also an unsteady process. And then add to that what happens when the fluid is, uh, is a crowd gen. So that's the kind of introduction and motivation of today's talk. We talked already about in the previous talks the impacts that cavitation has, so let's move on. Liquefied natural gas is an alternative fuel that has some interest, especially in large heavy duty commercial applications such as trucks, trains, and ships. Uh, British Columbia, which is the province in which I live and work, has large resources of, of natural gas. It wants to export that natural gas to markets in Asia <coughs> to displace coal being used for power generation and and also use the liquefied natural gas in transportation applications. So on the far right, there's a company in Vancouver called Westport Fuel Systems. They build liquefied natural gas engines for trucks and other large equipment. On the bottom right, ferries that move in and around the islands on the west coast of BC are now we operate uh, three LNG fuel, the Salish class ferries. And so these operate with liquefied natural gas fuel. Liquefied natural gas is a predominantly methane, mostly methane. There can be other higher hydrocarbons. There can be CO2 and nitrogen as well. The characteristics of liquefied natural gas is that it's stored at uh, less than negative 162 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere. It's stored at that very cold condition to increase its energy density. It's 600 to one versus uh, methane at, at one atmosphere. And that's better than compressed natural gas, which would, be, which would be 275 to one. When used in diesel or marine fuels, it, it's lower emissions. Obviously, it's not zero emissions, but it significantly reduces particulate and sulfur dioxide emissions. And so that makes it uh, advantageous. It's stored and operated near the critical point or near the saturation condition, which means it's subject to cavitation as it passes through check valves, pumps, and other pieces of equipment. And so cryogenic phase change of the liquefied natural gas in turbine machines and, and other flow components is relevant. We wanted to develop and validate a robust and efficient CFE tool that can study transition to turbulence, turbulent flow features, and cavitation in cryogenic fluids. The focus, of course, is LNG, but it can be expanded on to a look at other fluids as well. And the motivation here was to investigate the interaction of phase change processes, thermal effects, shear layer instabilities, and flow unsteadiness within the problem. And so to understand these, we needed to take a step back and look at specific questions and assumptions embedded within existing cavitation flow solvents. To do this, let's just remind ourselves about the most common cavitation model. So there may be in three categories. Interfacial dynamics models where we model the surface tension forces at the liquid vapor interface and we add source terms to the momentum equation. Density-based cavitation models where we have a, an equation of state um, formulated for the density field in terms of pressure. And then we solve additional transport equations for vapor fraction and the vapor fraction is coupled to the pressure through a correction procedure or the transport equation-based models. And those were the previous two talks employed uh, TEM, so-called TEM approaches, where you use an actual uh, cavitation model. And these cavitation models are developed based on a bubble two-phase flow approach, um, looking at the growth of, of cavitation bubbles following Rayleigh plus that equation, and they solve separate transport equations for liquid and vapor phases with additional source terms required for condensation and evaporation. And those source terms required an estimate for the initial distribution and diameter of bubbles within the flow. But that's challenging to understand in the context of cryogenic cavitation, where bubbles tend to be a lot more fine, a lot more uniformly dispersed, and it's very difficult to measure their size and their distribution within a, cavit within a cryogenic liquid. And so for those reasons, we wanted to move away from a transport equation-based model. 
as, dis as described here, where we have uh, vapor regions being assumed to have these clusters of bubbles of various sizes. And, and so in the context of cryogenic cavitation, where there's a lack of an appropriate equation of state for the uh, thermally sensitive properties near the, near the saturation point in cryogenic conditions and compressibility effects, et cetera, this motivated us to look at um, uh, developing a, sp a bespoke solver for cryogenic uh, uh, problems. So that's what we did. We developed a new cryogenic cavitation solver within open foam. We selected open foam because, well, one, we're at an open foam conference, but uh, we have experience within open foam at UBC, uh, the scalability, and the, the, the had an, a, a suitable starting point. And so we started with cavitating foam, which is a homogeneous equilibrium method solver within open foam. It has, um, the, the main assumption here is that cavitation occurs in thermodynamic equilibrium, which ignores viscous or turbulent dissipation work, uh, latent heat of ev evaporation and condensation, so thermal effects and thermal exchange between the liquid and the vapor during the cavitation process. It ignores also temperature dependence of the saturation pressure or pressure dependence of the saturation temperature, and it, uh, it is not suitable for the cryogenic uh, temperature dependent thermal physical properties uh, for relevant things such as the thermal conductivity, the specific heat, the viscosity, et cetera. And so we built onto cavitating foam. So it still has this uh, embedded assumption of being in a homogeneous equilibrium model, but then we, uh, uh, we, we tried to address some of the deficiencies for the, in the context of cryogenic liquids by adding on an, equation, uh, an, an energy equation. And we solve that in terms of static enthalpy. We add a temperature dependence of the saturation pressure using clausius clapeyron relationship to account for latent heat transfer during phase change. We uh, couple the cavitation model or the, 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 the flow solver to the temperature and enthalpy fields to account for the cryogenic, to calculate the phase fraction. By doing, doing that, we've modified the pimple loop, and then we have a generic thermophysical model to account for the fluid property libraries. We implemented some for natural gas, for liquid nitrogen, for water, and now we're moving on to liquid hydrogen. The model is described in full in the boxed paper from 2008 uh, journal paper in Applied Mathematical Modeling where we also describe uh, the validation of the solver. I, I don't have time to get into it today, so I'll just leave it there. If you're interested, there is a link in the bottom where you can go to how we validated the solver. Uh, essentially, the validation was for liquid nitrogen cavitation in Laval nozzle and also in circular orifice. These are the governing equations that we solve. So we have a mixture density and continuity equation, the first two equations. Then we solve a mixture pressure and momentum equation. And you'll notice terms there with capital L, which is the latent heat, which is important to capture for the latent heat exchange during the cavitation process. We have our energy equation, which is in terms of the mixture enthalpy, and then the cavitation model itself, which, which allows for us to capture the phase change and the fluid properties in terms of a mixture of liquid and vapor uh, fluid properties. To account for the, the temperature dependence of our thermal physical properties, we extended the Janoff model. This is for CP variation with methane, li for methane liquid and vapor species. So we have two polynomial functions, each for fourth order uh, for a high and low temperature range. And this is fit to NIST data for CP values at high and low pressure. So we, we have pressure that's relevant to the application. Um, and we found that there's not a significant sensitivity to pressure. So just a linear interpolation for intermediate pressures is sufficient. Um, so the, the polynomials that we're using here, these H terms are, are functions of pressure, but they're not tremendously so. And so a linear interpolation between the pressures that we used, actually for LNG, it's between four and seven bars. For liquid nitrogen, a different pressure range. But again, that's described in the paper. And then for the mixture viscosity, we used a temperature dependent coefficients in the Sutherland model and those temperature, uh, those coefficients are also functions of pressure, but we can get a linear interpolation being sufficient for the uh, modeling purposes. And then the temperature dependence of the saturation properties follows Pers-Goodwin theory, uh, which leads us to an Antoine's equation here where we have the 
pressure, uh, saturation pressure and the vapor phase, uh, excuse me, the, the, the saturation pressure as a function of temperature um, and then the latent heat exchange for the, during vaporization and condensation process is linked to the saturation pressure through this clausius clapeyron relationship. All right, now how do we couple it all together? We, model, we modified the pimple loop uh, with the uh, additional uh, inner, correction, inner correction loop where we have the um, temperature field calculated outside of the pimple loop. The vapor phase fraction is therefore not affected by the temperature field, so we needed to bring that in and solve it iteratively so that we could have thermal effects being accounted for within the phase fraction. So our energy equation is added inside the inner loop. Our density field, which comes from the bare tropic equation of state, is linked to the density from a thermal physical um, property model. Then we solve the um, momentum equation. We solve our updated phase fraction equation. We solve for the compressibility and there's different compressibility models that can be used. Um, then we update again, solving our pressure, momentum, and energy equation, and then this thermophysical models, and that brings us to the next outer loop. And so we do this in, in, in a sequence. All right, the, the specific test case that we're gonna be looking at today is transitional cavitating flow of a, mix, a mixing layer of LNG behind a flat, flat spitter plate. This is a 3D study. And we wanted to understand thermal effects, phase change, and shear layer instabilities and how they interact with one another in this flow, which is a free shear layer. The experiment looks like this. You have a flat splitter plate with a sharp leading edge. On top, you have a high velocity flow on the bottom, a low velocity flow, and then the two flows are allowed to merge. And of course, you have a shear layer that gets created and the shear layer undergoes instabilities that result in vortex uh, creating of, of uh, von Karman vortex street, their breakdown. Uh, into small three-dimensional structures and turbulence, and then at the same time, cavitation occurring within the, the cores of these vortical structures. It's based on an experiment from Elishman et al., the experimental apparatus, and some images that they captured are presented down below. Here's our computational domain. On the very top, it shows the kind of snapshot of the mesh, highlighting the spanwise periodic boundaries, the splitter plate, on the very bottom, we zoom in on the trailing edge mesh of the splitter plate. The splitter plate uh, domain size is here. We use a non-uniform structured 3D hex grid with about 40 million non-uniformly uh, spaced elements. Those were determined after grid independence study was done, which I won't show, but have in the backup slides if you do want to ask questions about it. We wanted to be able to call it a true DNS, so we tried to resolve all the way to Kolmogorov length scales. I, I'm not sure if I can confidently say we capture all of the energy spectrum, but we capture everything that's relevant and the Reynolds numbers are not so high that, um, that the, the energy is uh, across a very broad spectrum anyway. So hopefully we can say we've captured almost everything. The cavitation number is just, uh, given below uh, 0.21 and the velocity ratio and the total pressure ratio and the operating temperature as well as the Reynolds number follows what was presented in the experiment. These are animations that just walk through a little bit of the, the interesting results that are presented. The very top is the phase fraction, blue representing liquid and red representing vapor. We see that as the shear layer sheds downstream of the splitter plate, um, there's vorticity that's shed from the, the, the splitter plate, rolls up into coherent structures, those coherent structures merge. We have vortex pairing as we see in very common shear layer instability problems. But then as these large coherent structures merge, they also, you see large vapor cavities that are present there on the very top. And then there's a temperature that's, or heat that gets transferred from the liquid into the vapor. And so you see the vapor heating up slightly and the temperature growing. And so we again see the importance of thermal effects in the cryogenic condition. Uh, we think that the roll-up of the mixing layer can be attributed to a Calvin Humboldt instability. We, we see um, frequency peaks at the appropriate uh, and expected uh, frequencies uh, for Calvin Humboldt instability. We see cavities nucleate in the core of the vortices, and we see vortex pairing enhancing the growth of the vapor cavities. And these vortex cavity interactions also coincide with temperature gradients and latent heat exchange.
All right, let's look a little bit about some of the three-dimensional features we see downstream of the splitter plate. Um, the top image shows contours of the vapor phase fraction that's evolving. The flow is left to right. Um, the six other frames show isocontours of alpha, that is the vapor fraction of 0.85. So those represent regions that are quite near to the interface between the liquid and vapor. And what we see uh, in the first top left frame, a uh, primary vortex core has been shed and you see it's homogeneous, quite homogeneous in this bandwise direction. As they evolve downstream, you see an interaction of these primary vortex core tubes that leads to pairing, a distortion of those tubes and the creation of three dimensional structures, uh, which is present here uh, where you can see my cursor is located. These interacting tubes also coincide with and again, these are not vortical structures that we're looking at. These are uh, phase fractions. So we again see the coincidence of the vor vortex instabilities and shear layer instabilities that are present, as well as the, um, the, 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 the vapor cavities themselves. The creation of these three-dimensional structures that, that evolve downstream of the splitter plate is even more uh, noticeable on the bottom right side where we see these different labeled structures forming U-shaped cavities and croissant or crescent shaped uh, or vertical structures that, that, that result in re and side entrant jets on the splitter plate and the shedding of these uh, detached incipient and croissant shaped structures. This shows again that more or less the same times but highlighting the vertical structures by plotting in red isocontours of Q criterion and in white the same as in the previous slide isocontours of the vapor fraction of alpha equal to 0.85. And just kind of walking through, there's a lot on the slide, but the cavity tubes pockets we see interact quite extensively with the vortex tubes. There's the distortion of the trailing edge vortex tubes that forms primary hairpin shaped vortices. These primary hairpin shaped vortices then lead to secondary motions and secondary hairpin vortices. And there's uh, improved coherency of these as they interact with one another and then interact as well with the distorted cavity clouds. And, and there's this coincidence of the vortical structures and, the, and the, 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 the formed vapor cavities as well. Um, I think that's for the most part what we want to say in this slide. This presents um, alpha, so va va vapor phase fraction, temperature, as well as velocity magnitude viewed from the top um, at the later times where we see temperature head, well, the, the head of these vertical structures at a slice right through the center of the splitter plate. Um, and we see a high temperature region that expands into these horseshoe shaped cavity structures and these high temperature zones uh, and the growing cavities um, co coincide with the, the regions of temperature, thermal exchange between the vapor and the liquid. And then in the velocity magnitude, these coincide with accelerated liquid passages that form through the unstable vapor regions. And so there's the strong effect of the three dimensionality where the Kelvin Humboldt's instability mechanisms and the, the secondary flow form these spanwise gradients and there's this large distortion as a result of the vapor cavities. We wanted to characterize some of the spectral content of the flow and so this led us to look at the power spectral density at certain probed locations downstream of the shear layer. We did a supplementary two-dimensional study to compare the 3D DNS to the 2D um, shear layer and the, in the top blue line is the cavitating mixing layer in 2D and the red one is in 3D. And then corresponding on the bottom is the, the spectra for both. And they especially just point out the orange line. Uh, well, the, the green one here is a, um, is a low pass filtered plot for the 3D and the black one is for the 2D so we can see there's actually quite a bit of correspondence at the, the main frequency peak where we think that is associated with the Kelvin Helmholtz instability of the shear layer. But then at the higher frequencies, we see that there's more um, energy associated with higher uh, turbulent scales or, or vertical scales at the high frequency in the 3D flow, which is expected. Um, 
We also see suppressed pressure spikes. If you look at the top, this is plotting pressure minus the saturation pressure in the 3D case, and these are balanced by uh, local strong disturbances uh, that improve the shear in the mixture regions. And we also have enhanced roll-up mechanisms in the, in the 3D case that uh, is a result of the three-dimensionality that's allowed to grow within the vortical structures, and that strengthens uh, the, the idea that the shear layer instability, three-dimensionality is an important feature also in the, the, the uh, evolution of these, of these cavities as well. All right, so just to briefly summarize our results, we developed and validated a CFD solver for modeling cavitation in cryogenic fluids with the goal of gaining insight into the dynamics of thermally influenced cavitating flows of a liquid cryogen, in this case, liquid natural gas. The focus in this specific case study was to understand the transitional cavitating mixing layer of liquid natural gas behind a flat splitter plate. <coughs> the main observations involve the growth of unsteady cavitation, linking up with coherent vortical structures in a shear layer roll-up. The vapor cavities nucleate at the center of these vortical structures, and they evolve into large-scale vortical clouds through a vortex pairing. The vortex pairing, which is well understood, shear layer instability also links to the growth of these uh, cavities. Temperature-based, uh, the, the thermal effects are important. Thermal effects result in baroclinic vorticity and additional vortex dilation, dilatation, and that also impacts the, the shedding behavior of the vapor cavities. The temperature variations and the latent heat transfer, as well as local sa saturation pressure uh, uh, fluctuations, alter the vaporization and the condensation mechanisms. So we have a longer vaporization and thermodynamic delay, and thereby larger vapor production. And then also to comment the three-dimensionality of the flow that we're capturing in this case um, uh, helped us to understand the, the thermodynamic characteristics and the interactions between these cavities and the vortex interactions that then break down into turbulence. What we plan on doing next is to continue our investigation of transitional and turbulent cavitating flows in liquid cryogens. We want to develop and, and, and validate more VOF-based two-fluid mixture models because we want to use these in ap industrial applications with industrial collaborators and uh, develop complex equations of state, more complex than what we were able to accomplish here within the homogeneous equilibrium model, and then apply these to also look at non-Newtonian aspects of uh, cryogenic fluids, and then to then use it again for phase change phenomena and other types of applications, including microfluidics. So with that, I'll thank you very much for your time and be open for any questions. So yeah, we are open for uh, questions from the audience. Uh, we don't have any online questions as yet. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I think there is temperature change about two degrees of Kelvin, uh, okay. And is it good to use barotropic EOS with, for the temperature? I'm not sure. Probably something that needs to be improved upon, but it's a work in progress. Uh, thank you. Thank you. May I try one, please? Yes, if I uh, dare. I am not sure that I followed everything in the presentation, so I may be asking questions that you already answered. So as Shiva will tell you, there is a difference between cavitation and flash boiling. And the effect that needs to be captured is the heat transfer across the gas-liquid interface. Are you doing something about it, or do you have ideas of how this could be done in the future? So we are trying to capture the heat transfer across the gas-fluid interface. Um, we're doing that through solving energy equation and coupling it with our other equations. Um, we have this modified pimple loop that, uh, that adjusts these equations so that that can be captured properly. If your question is how would we modify these things to simulate flash boiling, I'm not sure. I haven't looked at that. Um, but I think in that case, what we would be expecting is, is even more of an influence of latent heat exchange. And so maybe the approach that we've done here is suitable 
where we have relatively small thermal exchanges between the vapor and the liquid, um, but perhaps needs to be revisited or, or explored in rapid phase transitions. Thank you very much. I think this is really excellent work, so thank you for presenting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Thanks. Uh, I just have a comment to what Herb mentioned uh, with respect to flash boiling. I think because of the scale of your application, it's not as important as it, but when you go down to the microfluidic level, when the scales go down yeah. and the time scale of the flow changes, I think the heat transfer, which Herb mentions, will become really important, and that time HEM may not be the best way to go. You might have, have Yes, very good. Maybe we just take this bullet out of the slide and we'll be all happy. <laughs> no, no, I think the, the bullet is important. It's just that, you know, you might uh, want to look at that interface heat, heat yeah. transfer at that point in time. It, it's an addition to your model. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think nucleation is an important and well uh, not well understood question, especially yeah. in the context of cavitation. Yeah. We, my, my, my subsequent students were trying to explore a more fundamental understanding of, of uh, nucleation because again, the question is, well, where is the cavity going to nucleate? Or if yeah. you have a pool boiling kind of problem, where is the cavity going to occur? Oftentimes, when we're simulating pool, pool boiling, we we uh, we initiate we initialize where the nucleation yeah. is going to occur. That's not feasible. Good. And in the case of my uh, industrial collaborators, they're asked they want to know if we spill a bunch of LNG onto the ferry, how is it going to boil? Yeah. And then what's the heat exchange rate? And then where is the vapor? How much vapor is going to be created? And where is it going to go? That's what they want to know. Yeah. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our next speaker is going to be the last speaker for this session. And uh, he could not join us here physically, so he'll be delivering this uh, talk online. Our next speaker is uh, Merdad Kazemi from the University of Rostock. And he is going to be talking on scale resolving simulation of a cavitating bow thruster using open core. Thanks. Hello, everybody, and I hope you are all having a good day here. <laughs> so uh, my name is uh, first, can you hear me? Uh, could anybody please confirm if you can hear me? Yes, okay. I can. Yeah, yeah, good. So uh, my mm -hmm. name is Merdad Kazemi, and uh, I am a PhD student at the Chair of Modeling and Simulation at University of Rostock. What I want to present to you today is a scale resolved simulation of cavitating bow thruster using open form. Uh, so the content of this presentation are as follows. Uh, we are going to talk about motivation uh, of this study, general information, geometry, SLH and DDS models, probing points, power spectrum diagrams, pressure time history diagrams, and time average force and momentum. So for motivation, uh, as you know, majority of the ship hydrodynamic simulation uh, has been doing with uh, RANS or URANS, and it has been shown that they have an error margin of about 5%. You can look at Tokyo CFD workshop for that. And uh, for capturing unsteady loads, uh, such as uh, uh, could be caused by uh, cavitation, flow separation, vortices, and et cetera, uh, it is better to use a scale resolve simulation. And due to the uh, big number or a huge number of the grid, when we use pure LES, uh, we try to use a hybrid model uh, of LES and URANS. Uh, and aim of my study is the understanding of the physics uh, and the effect of unsteady effects inside the bow thruster, increasing the efficiency of that and reducing uh, unsteady loading and noise emission. So uh, just uh, general information, if we want to uh, talk about the turbulence models, we know that the picture on the top presents that uh, for the RANS model, we uh, solve large 
eddies uh, directly, but when we move to the earliest, the on largest energy containing vortices are directly solving, and small vortices are modeling using theoretical and universal models. And then uh, DNS model, all vortices are directly uh, resolved and no additional closure model are necessary. So if you look at this spectrum, we see uh, the semi-imperial models that we use uh, for some part of the uh, spectra of turbulence uh, for RANS and universal model for uh, using some part of the spectra of DNS and uh, for, uh, for LAS and DNS will do the whole spectra. So a scale result simulation strategy aims to resolve all or a portion of the turbulence spectrum and consider all turbulence scale to the grid dissipative limit. So for the reference, uh, you can look at uh, the paper and the book here. And if we move to the next, so for general information in my uh, case, I am using open form version 2012, and the geometry contains a moving propeller of a uh, speed of 10, 18 RPM. The dimension of the geometry are kept similar to the dimension of the experimental parts. Uh, the geometry of my study is presented in the picture on the top, uh, and uh, the magnified part on the bottom picture, and the picture on the bottom of it is the, this uh, small part at the middle uh, section for the whole towing tank. So flow is uh, from left to right, and arbitrary mesh interface has been applied for dynamic uh, mesh. Simulation has been done using 13 million cells. Measurements uh, for this case has been done with our uh, project partner, which is Yastram company. And geometries uh, of the simulation are kept uh, as similar as possible to the experimental data. Two hybrid models uh, are used, DDS model and the shielded Lemos hybrid model and a urans model which use a uh, calm elasticity as a closure are used for uh, this simulation so for slh and dds model both of these model are hybrid urans LES model which implement urans uh, near the wall and the LES away from it DDDS model uh, is from DES family uh, and the shielded Lemos hybrid model has been developing in uh, University of Rostock in our chair, uh, chair of modeling and simulation. The level of the pressure fluctuation in hybrid model goes uh, closer to experimental fluid dynamic data. And uh, let's uh, talk a bit more detail in the hybrid model. So in DDS model, uh, the DES length scale is defined as follows. So it uh, gives us, if the FD is equal to zero, it gives us the urans or goes or activates the urans and if FD is equal to one, it activates DES. And in this formation, D is the distance to the wall and CDES is a constant and delta is the maximum of uh, cell size in each direction. So for further information, you can uh, look at the paper of uh, Spallard and Flick. And when we go to the SLH model, we are, uh, the SLH model which have been developed in our chair, uh, uses integral length scale and it's defined as a big O uh, and which is presented here and the delta. And in this current formula, a uh, small delta represents a cubic, uh, cube root of cell volume and uh, D max is the max of cell size in all directions. So in, uh, we talked about that in DDS, uh, the FD uh, defines the part uh, in which region we are going to solve urans and LES, but in SLH model, uh, if the L is bigger than the delta, then the cell is in the LES region, and if the L is a smaller than delta, the cell is in the Urans region. Please uh, refer to this paper for further information and a probing point. 
So we now talked about the models and the geometry. Uh, in this uh, geometry, there is 14 probing points, which we have the data, experimental data for them. Uh, but I'm going to present to you only four uh, probing points. And these probing points uh, are chosen in a way that represent before the propeller location, before propeller uh, location, after propeller, at the top of the tunnel, at the bottom of the tunnel. And also uh, the reason behind that is that for some of these probing points, we expect uh, big separation such as 0.7 and for some of the points we don't expect separation like uh, 0.5 and 0.11. So if we go to the uh, data for the point 2, we see here power spectrum density of uh, different simulation, the result of different simulation for the cases without cavitation on the picture on the left side and the same result for the yeah, same models on the simulation after introduction of the cavitation on the picture on the right side. So we see by introducing the cavitation, the value of power spectrum density for each frequency increases, which is the behavior that we expected to happen. And we see here that uh, between blade passing frequencies, the DDS model shows a drop in value and the urans acts as a discrete signal. So let's talk about the time his oh sorry, what happened? Just a minute, sorry. So pressure time history of point uh, two. If we talk about the pressure time history of the point two, we see after introduction of the cavitation to our simulation. Uh, we see that the pressure time history is more uh, stochastic and uh, the amplitude of this pressure is bigger and closer to uh, experimental fluid dynamic. Now let's talk about point 0.5. So point 0.5 is before the propeller at the top side. Uh, it is the location that we do not expect a big separation uh, at the and the interesting phenomena or interesting behavior that happens here is that we see that DDS model, uh, I'm talking about the picture on the left side, which is the simulation without the cavitation. We see the DDS model, which is represented with the blue line, is more or less similar to the Urans model and SLH model is behaving differently. So SLH model in the simulation without cavitation is presenting a better result, which is closer to the value of experimental fluid dynamic. But uh, we see a discrete signal for both uh, DDS and URANS model. After implementation of the cavitation, uh, we see increase in the all uh, power pressure, uh, power spectrum density of the pressure data, and the behavior of the DDS uh, get closer to the behavior of the SLH model, but still for the urans we see drops uh, of the value in between blade passing frequencies. So. Uh, and we are going to talk about these drops uh, in next slide. So for pressure time history for 0.5, we see the same behavior that we have seen in 0.2, that uh, by introducing the cavitation into the, our simulation, uh, the value of the pressure are uh, chaotic, getting more chaotic, and the amplitude of the pressures increases and our values uh, get similar or get closer to the experimental flow dynamic values. So for 0.5 that we mentioned, uh, we do not expect big separation here. Uh, and you can see that uh, on the picture on the left side. And on the picture on the right side, one more time is the power spectrum density of the 0.5. So one more time, if we look at it, we see that the DDS 
model, which here is the, with the green line, is similar to the Urans model, which is presented here with the blue line, and is uh, quite different to the values of the SLH model, which is presented with the red line. So we think uh, the reason behind is uh, behind this uh, uh, this is that uh, in DDES model, the LES part is not triggered at the point 0.5 because there is no big separation. And because LES model is not triggered, the DDES model acts uh, like Urant's model. Uh, so both of them shows a discrete signal with huge drops between blade passing frequency and SLH model, which uh, is shielded Lomos hybrid model, uh, works better and uh, is activated. So the LES part in SLH model is activated here, uh, even in the uh, position without a big separation like 0.5. So if we move to 0.7, uh, we see that the 0.7 is the location at the bottom of tunnel before uh, the propeller. And in this point, we expected a big separation. And uh, we can see uh, quite different to what have been seen in point five. DDS model and SLH model uh, gave the same spectrum. And the Urans model uh, shows drops between blade passing frequency. And by introducing a cavitation one more time, we can see that the all Data, regardless of the model, uh, increase the value of power spectrum density. And this is what we expect. So if we go to the pressure time history one more time, we can see by introducing pressure time, uh, by introducing cavitation, uh, behavior of the pressure gets more uh, stochastic and the amplitude of pressure increases. And uh, so, but if we, uh, so however, uh, we have seen that uh, behavior of DDS model and SLH model is more or less the same in the 0.7 uh, at the location with big separation. If we magnify uh, the picture in the location of blade passing frequency, which the magnified picture is presented in the right side, you can see that uh, a drop of this uh, power spectrum density for DDS, which is the blue line. And uh, we see a drop for DDS model between blade passing frequency. It's obvious for blade, uh, between blade passing frequency one, two, and two, three. And Urans shows uh, a discrete signal and that the drop in Urans is a huger. So we can say a, magni uh, a magnitude a huger uh, uh, drops for the Urans, but uh, SLH uh, remains more or less in the same level uh, and uh, gives the closer data to the experimental plate dynamic. For the point 11 is the, again a point that uh, we don't expect big separation. So we have seen the same behavior that we have seen in point five, different behavior for DDS model compared to SLH model, although both of them are hybrid model, but in DDS model, somehow it seems that uh, LES branch is not triggered and behavior of the DS is similar to the UN. So we see discrete signal and the huge drops between blade passing frequency. And uh, this, if we go to the pressure time history, we see more chaotic uh, behavior of the pressures at the point 11 after introduction, the cavitation. And uh, one more time, this is the, uh, on the left side, you see the spectrum of this point 11 after introduction of cavitation into our simulation. So uh, we have improvement for the spectrum of DDS and Urans, uh, although uh, we can see in the magnified picture on the right that we still have drops of the value between blade passing frequency while in DDS and Urans. 
uh, and we don't see these drops of value in SLH model. And uh, if we go to the average force comparison, uh, this is presented a relative error for total force and propeller thrust for different simulation with and without cavitation. Uh, I should mention that the total force is the force that is applied to all components within tunnel. So we can see by introducing cavitation, uh, the average uh, force, the relative error of average force, both for total force and propeller thrust uh, drops. For example, in Urans, uh, the total force relative error without cavitation is 8.9%. After introduction of the cavitation, this relative error drops to 5.1%. For propeller thrust, uh, we see this relative error from 10.9% drops to 4.2%. And the same behavior happens for hybrid model, DDS model, and SLH model. Uh, also, we see that SLH model uh, has higher accuracy in general compared to the other two models uh, for both cases without cavitation and with cavitation. For example, the relative error of the total force for SLH model is uh, in the case without cavitation 5% while uh, in the urans the same number is 8.9 and for dds is 9.1% and after introduction of cavitation this uh, error for slh drops to 2.3% uh, while the the error relative error for dds model is 4.9% and for urans model is 5.1% and uh, the average momentum comparison, uh, this is the propeller momentum of different model and uh, compared to the experimental fluid dynamic data. Uh, here we see a different behavior uh, and here we see that after introduction of the cavitation or in the simulation with cavitation, uh, the relative error <coughs> of uh, this propeller momentum increase slightly. So for example, in urans, uh, cases with cavi without cavitation have error of 1.5%, but after introduction of the cavitation, we have the error of 2.2%. The same happens for other two models for DDS and SLH also. Uh, so as a summary, we have seen that the implementation of cavitation improved the spectrum, uh, that increased the spectrum values, and these spectrum values get uh, closer or more similar to the experimental fluid dynamic values. We have seen that hybrid model shows a clear advantage over the urans, uh, while the urans has a discrete signal and huge drop between blade passing frequencies. We have seen that the implementation of the cavitation increased the accuracy of the result for the average forces. And we have seen among two hybrid Urans LES model, SLH performs better. And this is obvious in the point uh, that there is no big separation. And the lastly, uh, we have seen implementation of the cavitation increase uh, the stochastic behavior of the pressure and the pressure amplitude. So that was all. Thank you all. So. Uh, we could have some questions from the audience. Uh, there are no questions in the chat box, but if the online audience wants to unmute themselves and ask, that's also okay. And if the in-person audience wants to ask one question. Any questions here on the floor? Okay, uh, I have one question. Uh, when you compared uh, these three uh, models, the SLH model obviously was more accurate, but how much of a computational cost did you have to pay more? Or did you compare uh, what were Actually, the computational efficiencies mm -hmm. of the three models? Mm -hmm. 
sorry for interrupting. Uh, actually, the computation time for SLH model and the VDS model is the same. So it's like two, three percent more or less. It depends on the case. So it's not that big a deal in the computation time and computation cost. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Are there any other questions at this point? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker once more.